Okay, so thank you very much for this kind invitation and for the kind introduction. It's really my pleasure to be here and to give a talk at ECML. It's in fact the first time I attend ECML, maybe this shouldn't have been the case, but that's how it is. And I'm really pleased to be here now. Um, the first thing I have to figure out is how to talk in this room because it's, it feels a bit funny here. Um, anyway, uh, if you can't see me anymore, please start to shout. Okay, so my talk today is, is going to be about unsupervised learning on graphs. And I guess many of you know graph algorithms in machine learning, or I guess most of you know them. There's like spectral clustering, there are manifold algorithms like isomap, there are semi-supervised learning algorithms like label propagation. And all these algorithms operate in graphs. And the idea is, the very general topic is that on a graph, the, the edges encode some local information about the data, so for example, local similarities of your data. But the main idea is that the global structure of your data is sort of represented in the graph. So the graph is supposed to encode things like the cluster structure, or a manifold structure, or any other kind of geometric things you might be interested in. And the reason why we use graphs is now because we think that graphs are a good representation for these kind of geometric structures, and we hope that like if you have a suitable algorithms at least we can extract this information from the graph. Right? So this is the main motivation for graph algorithms. Now what are the graphs that are out there? In fact, I think there are two main types of graphs which are used a lot in this community. Um, the first one is what is called natural graphs. So natural graph, that is what is usually also studied in this com science, com science of complex networks, say the World Wide Web. Vertices are web pages, links point to other web pages. Or Facebook, a social network, vertices are people, and link, link point to my friends, and these are sort of, uh, that also has a very uh, natural graph structure. So here the key point is really <coughs> that in this type of data, the data somehow is a graph. It's not an abstract representation of something else, but you say the natural way to, to, to represent the data is a graph. And then, I mean, people in, in complex network science go ahead and try to look at degree distributions and centrality indices and all these kinds of things, right? So I think in machine learning, we often have to deal with a different kind of graph. Not always, and I mean, I know there's lots of work also in this community about social networks and graphs and, and stuff and, and, and questions in these areas. But in many areas, we work with what, is, what I would call a similarity graph. <coughs> and the situation is now the following. The vertices of your graph encode particular objects, say proteins, right? And the edges in the graph are supposed to encode local information, uh, service information between your points. So you just know whether two points are very similar, and then you put an edge in this graph. And this is somewhat a different situation than the one in, in this complex network science field. Because here we don't really know, so the graph is a condensed and abstract version of your data, but it's not the most natural thing to do. I mean, you could do many different things to your data. And the question I want to now to discuss in this talk is now whether if you go from your raw, from your raw data to this abstract description, whether you lose a lot of information on the way, or whether, you, whether this is helpful or whether this is not helpful at all. Right? So this is the main question I want to discuss. <coughs> And just to show you what, what my point is, I want to, to discuss a particular example. It's, it's a toy example here. Assume you are given proteins and you want to say you want to apply a manifold algorithm to your proteins because, for example, you want to visualize the protein. I mean, think that's, that's a straightforward thing to do. So what you do is, first of all, you select a set of proteins. You compute similarity scores between your proteins. And the biology people will tell you what kind of scores to use. For example, they tell you to use last score. These are like local alignment scores um, for proteins. Now the machine learner goes ahead, takes these scores, builds a K-nearest neighbor graph, has some rule of sum for choosing K. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's a bit of theory, but I'm really, I mean, you just choose some K, okay? <coughs> and then you think, okay, maybe these similarity scores I have are in fact not so representative. I don't really trust them so much, so maybe I do trust the ordering given by the, by the similarity scores, but maybe not the actual scores. So let's just throw away the weights, use an unweighted Kenyus neighbor graph. It needs less storage space anyway. Right? So we use an unweighted Kenyus neighbor graph. Then we say, well, maybe our graph is too big, so let's just sparsify it. We want to have a smaller graph. Okay, now we start thinking about, oh, yes, we want to do isomap, so we need to compute shortest path distances in our graph between all pairs of vertices. 
And this is now what we plug into ISOMAP, and ISOMAP gives, gives us a mapping of our data in Euclidean space. Right? And I guess you see where I'm heading at. So we've do, done like 10 different things to our raw data, and in all of these things, something can go wrong, or maybe not. But the question is really that do things go wrong or don't they go wrong? This is really the question I want to discuss in this talk. So what do I mean by the information that is going to be lost or maybe not lost? So of course one very important part of information is the data density, right? I mean all about machine learning theories, you have particular densities, you have conditional class densities and so on, and all these densities are important. And if you know like if you knew all the density of your data, you could do everything. So you wouldn't need to learn anything, right? So essentially machine learning is is the task of learning some abstract functions of this density, essentially. <coughs> so the first question is. If I have such an unweighted k nearest neighbor graph, is the density still present in this graph or not? I mean, this is not, not very obvious, and I'm going to discuss it in detail later on. And if I apply sparsification, is the density now still present or not? <coughs> and now we compute shortest path distances. So how are these shortest path distances really related to the underlying density of the underlying, of the underlying points? And finally, about clustering, I mean, I'm not going to talk about clustering today, but it's, it's the same kind of question. If we want to do clustering, did the cluster information survive all these three processing steps or not? Right? So these are the kind of questions I want to ask. Now I'm working in learning theory, so I have to first formalize my questions before I can sort of answer them. And so what I do is a standard kind of approach people do in learning theory. I assume I have some model by which my data has been generated. Then I, apply, like, I, I draw data from this kind of model, apply all the pre-processing steps, and later on I check whether I can still estimate all my model parameters or whether I can get the information about the model back. Right? So this is what I want to do in this talk. And because I'm interested in similarity graphs, I look at random geometric graphs because this is a kind of mathematical model for, for the similarity graphs. Okay? So similarity graphs, uh, I think most people would know what this means, or at least if I explain it, they would have seen it before. So the model is the following. We start with some... Okay, so in this talk I concentrate on Euclidean space. You can also do this more generally, but let's just stick for, to the Euclidean space with a particular density. Assume we have such a density on the space, like this mixture of two Gaussians, for example, I appear on the left-hand side. Now we draw n points according to this density. These are the vertices of our graph. And we connect two points, two, two vertices by an edge if they are among the k-nearest neighbor of each other. Right? So this is a very simple rule. This is the k-nearest neighbor rule. It leads to an undirected graph in this case. And now, in no, what, what is done in most cases is people also put edge weights on the edges, which are, for example, Gaussian edge weights. Right? So this is the standard way, but there are other, you could also do other choices, but this is sort of the most common choice. Right? So this is what I'm going to call a weighted k-nearest neighbor graph in this talk. And from the statistical learning perspective, weighted k nearest neighbor graphs are really great. I mean, you can do everything with them. Um, the first thing is you can ask, like the degrees in the graph are an estimate of the density. So the degree, uh, for those who don't know, is just the number of, like the edge, the sum of the edge weights attached to each particular vertex. And if you do this in a weighted k nearest neighbor graph, it's essentially just a kernel density estimate. So the degree in each in, uh, is going to show it, the degree of each vertex is an estimate for the density at this particular point in space. And you can see this here on the left-hand figure. Um, it's, the it's the estimated, it's the degrees in this graph. And it, I mean, it's the same graph as the one here on the, can I use the mouse? So this is the density we have. And this is the graph corresponding to this. And you sort of see, I mean, just by visual inspection, this seems to fit, right? So this is nice. What is also nice is that if you look at shortest path distances in this graph, they are also what you would like to expect. So if you compute the shortest path distance between two points in the, in the weighted k nearest neighbor graph, we see it here on the right hand side, sort of, at least if the graph is large enough, if you have enough sample points, the shortest path approximates a straight line between your two points, and the distance approximates the Euclidean distance in the underlying space. So from this point of view, everything is nice. We could end the story here, and it's even a bit boring from a theoretical point of view. So let's move to a bit more complicated situation. The unweighted k nearest neighbor graph. And this is what I'm going to concentrate on in my talk now. So the unweighted k nearest neighbor graph, we do exactly the same kind of, of construction as before. We draw n points from our density, we connect the k nearest neighbor, but now we don't put any weights on the edges. We just keep it as it is. And if we keep on, if we try to think about what is encoded in the in this adjacency matrix of the k nearest neighbor graph, I mean we throw away 
scale information because we don't know how long the edges are anymore, we don't have any edge weights, but we keep some kind of ordinal information. And I try to put it on the slide here. If you have two points in the graph, if you have three points in the graph, two of them are connected, so xi is connected to xj but not to xl, then at least you can conclude that the distance between xi and xj is smaller than the one, than the one between xi and xl. Right? So this is the kind of information mm -hmm. you, you have in a chain nearest neighbor mm -hmm. graph. So you just have ordinal information, which means you can compare at least a couple of distances to each other, not all of them, because if, two, if points are not connected at all, you don't know anything about the distances. <coughs> but this is all you get. And if you look at this figure here, which I have done here, I want to illustrate this point. So here, what I, uh, what I have here is, uh, it's, it's a graph from a mixture of two uniform densities. On the left-hand side, it's a low, very low uniform density. On the, on the right side here, it's a, here it's a higher uniform density. But if you look at these two red areas and you say, I suggest select an area which contains roughly 100 points, then just by looking at these areas, you wouldn't be able to see whether they come from a low or from a high density. There's no way you can, could distinguish it like these two regions from each other just by looking at uh, the adjacent symmetry. And the point is really that in the standard weighted can in the weighted can nearest neighbor graph, you would have the edge lengths, which are the yellow things here in my plot. So here, for example, you see in a low density region the edge lengths are pretty large, and in a high density region the edges are pretty short. So this would be would give you information about the density, but we don't have that anymore, right? Now the question is what can we do about it? <coughs> but maybe let's step a bit on this kind of question. Uh, the first answer is because from a theoretical point of view it's interesting, okay? but um, there are more serious answers to this question. Uh, the first one is that many, at least if you look at this social network kind of uh, network science research, in this area all graphs are unweighted. You always have, like in the world of web, you have just links, they don't have any edge weights, right? And so it's a very, very important question to figure out what is the kind of information you are in principle able to encode in an unweighted graph. So are you able to encode density information? So if you're not able to do that, then somehow unweighted graphs are problematic. Right? The other kind of <coughs> the, the, the other reason why I'm interested in unweighted graphs is this difference between ordinal information and quantitative scale information. So often in very many applications it's easy to say, here I have two things which are very similar, and here I have two things which are very dissimilar from each other. So this is often very easy. But it's usually very hard to come up with a quantitative way of scaling this, right? You could say, say I mean, I have this example on the, sli on the slide, these two movies have a similarity of 0 0.9, and these other two movies are 0 0.1. But, I mean, where do I take 0 0.1 from? It could also be 0 0.4, right? I mean, it's just a number I come up with, and the only thing I, in fact, know myself about these numbers is that one should be larger than the other one, but how to choose them is really not so obvious in many applications. But now if you provide a machine learning algorithm with all these numbers, of course the algorithm is going to take it seriously. I mean, if I tell him it's 0.1 and it's 0.3, then the algorithm believes it's 0.1 but not 0.3. But if I just tell him uh, these things are similar and these things are dissimilar, and the algorithm knows about the fact that I, I'm not so sure about all these things, then maybe the algorithm has a better chance of dealing with all these things. And so this is the reason why I think that unweighted graphs are in, in fact very interesting to look at. Now, let's look at the statistics questions for an unweighted k nearest neighbor graph. <coughs> the first one is the density estimation question. In the weighted k nearest neighbor graph, you could just look at the degrees. But if you now look at this left uh, plot here on the left hand side, these are the degrees of the same sample but in an unweighted k nearest neighbor graph. And you already see that the degrees are completely non informative about the density. I mean, this is somehow clear the degrees in a k n graph are more or less of all k, right? It's a k nearest neighbor graph. I mean, some degrees might be a bit larger because they look at the undirected graph and there might be some points which get some more inlinks than other points, but all in all, usually they are about k, so you can't estimate the density. And the other thing that is funny, I mean, the geometry usually is very tightly connected to lengths of paths, but if you now look at shortest path distances in the, in the unweighted k nearest neighbor graph, the shortest paths look really funny. I mean, here in the, in the plot on the right hand side here, I fix two data points, this guy and this guy, and the red line is the shortest path between these data points, and it does not go along the straight line, it takes a huge detour through the outskirts of this whole data set, and this really looks funny and some more questions whether there's any use in this kind of distance information. 
And this is now the question I want to discuss. Um, so the talk is now going to contain three different sub-chapters, sort of, um, all related to three different questions. And I want to stress again, and we're going to look at the unweighted k-nearest neighbor graph, which means I just have the adjacency matrix. I also don't have any point embeddings. So I mean, in my theoretical model, data comes from points, but I don't know these point locations. I just know uh, the point number four is in the k-nearest neighbor set of point number 17. <laughs> this is all the information I have. And now the question is, if I have this kind of information, what, first of all, can we say about the shortest path? Um, and once we know that, we can see how to exploit this knowledge. And then the, the, other, the other big question is, can we estimate the density from this graph? So here is now the first section about the shortest path. Again, the question here, just for illustration, again, the two figures on the left-hand side, we have the weighted k neighbor graph, on the right-hand side, the unweighted. On the left-hand side, we know it, it's about the Euclidean distance. On the right-hand side, we don't know. It just looks funny. OK, now I want to show you what, this, uh, what, what we can say about the shortest path distance. And to say this, I first of all need to introduce a bit of notation. So what I want to say is, in the end, I take n sample points, and as, I tend, as n goes to infinity, at some point I know something about the shortest path distance, right? So this is why I always carry the index n with my objects. So Gn is the unweighted k nearest neighbor graph on n sample points. Dsp is going to denote the shortest path distance here. And I have the superscript n to just tell you we're on the graph based on n data points. <coughs> And now we define a new length function on Rd. So this is now going to lead to the limit object of the shortest path distance. Um, and it works as follows. So just assume you have any path gamma, no matter what, any continuous path in your space. Uh, maybe, let's say, a nice path, so we can measure its length. And the way we measure its length is now as follows. We integrate from 0 to 1, so from start point to end point. The density, so p is the density to the power 1 over d, d is the dimension, along the path. So this is, this is just a standard way of defining, I mean, and, and then we have the, the velocity vector here, this is just um, to take into account the way we pa parameterize the path. So essentially what happens here is, as we go along the path, we sum up this function p to the power 1 over d, where p is the underlying density. Now if you don't really, if you're not so good at uh, decoding such formulas, I have a picture here. So just assume the blue thing here is a path, so it goes from x to y. And to measure the length of this path, what we now do is we chop it into small pieces. These are the red curves here, these red bits here. Um, and we just say the length of the path is approximately the, length of the sum of the length of these small bits here. And the length of one of these pieces we compute as uh, the Euclidean length of the piece times the density to the power 1 over d in this area. So this is what we do to, to measure the length of the path. It's not the natural length we have, but it's a new kind of length function. And just to get, a, get an idea of what this length function does is, um, here I show again, so this is a contour plot of this density we've seen so often before, like this mixture of two Gaussians. And I fix two points here, the two black blobs here, and we compare two paths, the white one and the red one. And the white one is now a very long path in this new measure because it exactly goes to this high density, which is here, where this high density. So as we walk along this path, here we accumulate quite a lot of weight of the density. So the length we assign to this white path is going to be reasonably long. So. And the red path here, it tries to avoid to go to this high density region. Um, it is going to be shorter in this length because it doesn't accumulate so much. I mean, the, the density values it sums up are very small, so the overall length of this path is short. Right? So this is now the new IP distance. And now, um, what we define is the, uh, now we define a new distance function in our underlying space, which is just the shortest IP distance between two points. So you, if you want to know what is now a new distance function in space for these two fixed points, you look at all paths connecting these points and take the, the one which is shortest according to this new distance function. Right. You, you can now guess where it's heading. Um, we now have a formal way of relating the shortest path distance in the, in the graph to, the, to this new distance function in our underlying space. Namely, um, up to, so here we have some scaling functions, but what happens is the shortest path distance in the graph is going to converge to this shortest distance, LP distance in the underlying space. As n goes to infinity, and k also goes to infinity, but slowly. Right? 
And so I have, I mean, the, the toy figure down here, so here we have the shortest path distance in the graph, and it's going to converge to something, and I made this up here on the right hand side, and so this is how maybe this limit path is going to look like. Okay, so this is now, I mean, by itself, we can take it as some, some theoretical result. It doesn't have any meaning whether, I mean, whether it's good or bad, we don't really know. This is first of all fact. So what we know now is, we can, ex we can say the shortest path <coughs> distance in the unrelated canyons never have corresponds to this continuous distance function. And now we can try to see whether we can exploit this or not, or whether this is helpful or not helpful in particular applications. <coughs> and of course, I mean, uh, I guess many of you would guess that already it really depends on the application whether this distance function is not good or bad. So I mean, depending on what I want to do with the distance function, different distance functions might be good or bad. And I now want to show a couple of examples. The first one where it doesn't really work is isomer. This is the example I started with. So for those of you who don't know, isomer essentially what it does, we're given a graph. What we do is we compute the shortest path distances in the graph. And then we try the isomer algorithm, essentially does multidimensional scaling. It tries to find an embedding into the Euclidean space such that after the embedding, the Euclidean distance in your space is the same as the shortest path distance you had before in your graph. And I mean, you can guess already from these figures we've seen that this goes wrong, but here I have a, a nice demonstration for what happens. So this is just a very, I mean, it's obviously very toy data, just some background uniform distribution, and in the foreground we have two higher density areas here, these squares. This is what we take as original data. And now what I do is I take these data points, I build the unweighted Kangaroo's neighbor graph, compute choice path distances, and then apply isomap to find a, 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 yet another embedding of this data set into R2. And on the right hand side is what we get. Like if it would have worked, we would have get gotten more or less the same kind of figure. And this obviously looks very different. Um, I mean, there are some, and, and in particular, what happens here, we have these high density areas in the original data, they are completely lost in this new kind of representation. I mean, they simply disappear. Right? And there's, in fact, later on, we are going to see. And there's a systematic way how you can explain this because the shortest path distance in, in unweighted KNN graphs is related to some kind of, it, it tends to make the data uniform in a certain way. And we're going to see how this, what this means um, more abstractly later, but here you can sort of see one, one visualization of this because, the, I mean, you need to, to, to believe me in this now, but this is sort of tends to be a uniform distribution, at least if the sample size gets larger. So, I mean, definitely this shows, um, if we want to do isomap, the shortest path distance in the unweighted KNN graph definitely is not what we want to do. Another example where it's also not what we want to do is semi-supervised learning. In semi-supervised learning, we have uh, the, the idea is we have very many unlabeled data points, and we want to exploit the cluster structure of these unlabeled data points to label some, to, and we have few labeled data points, and we sort of want to propagate these labels along the clusters. I mean, it's an assumption that this is going to give you the correct result. But the way this usually works is um, we define a new, so um, we have these many unlabeled points. We use our unlabeled points to define a new distance. Oh, sorry, to define a new distance function. And this distance function has to be such that the distances, if a path goes through a high density region, it's supposed to have a low, a, a small distance. Because what we want is here in this figure we have the star point here and the zero point here. These are our two labeled. Stupid laptop. Here, um, they are the two label points, and now we want to know is this question mark point, is it a, is it a star or a circuit? And we would say we, the path with the high density region is what we want, so we would assign this path a low weight, and then we would say it's probably a circuit. Right? But if you, I mean, observe, this is really the opposite of what our function does. So here we say paths are supposed to be short if they go through a high density region, and what this LP distance does is exactly the opposite paths are short if they go through low density. So you see that if you want to do semi-supervised learning, this is probably not the best distance function to choose. Okay, so these are two negative examples. Now I want to also show you a couple of positive examples, but those take more time. Um, take more time, so this is going to be the next two sections. <coughs> so maybe this is a point for those who were lost already to try to re-enter the talk. Um, now we're going to talk about vector quantization. And for now, um, you can't see what the relation is, but we're going to see it soon. So vector conversation is again yet another preprocessing step, right? So you have very many data points, and data points at n is very large, say I don't know, 10 million, um, because you want to know, I don't know, you want to know. build a movie recommender system and you have so many movies. But now you think 10 million is maybe a bit too large, so I want to downsample. 
or at least whether I want them or not, but I want to achieve, I want to have uh, to select a small number of representatives, M, um, and then I want to keep on working with these representatives instead of my original data. And of course, the idea is that these representatives sort of are supposed to cover the whole space and cover all aspects um, of my data. And the standard approach is you just say, okay, I define a distortion function, maybe the square Euclidean distance, or some LP distance if you want, and then you assign, you just, just try to select your representatives such that this distortion function is minimized. And for example, the Kimmins algorithm is just a standard way of doing that. So I think most people would be familiar with that. Now this has, from a theoretical point of view, a pretty big disadvantage effect. And the disadvantage is that if you uh, have a data set drawn from some distribution P, and now you select representatives with k-means, um, then the representatives do not follow the same distribution as your original data. And here I have an illustration. So what I did here is um, the data is a Gaussian distribution. You can see you can again see the heat plot. Uh, I sample 500 points, I think, and then select 50 representatives. And what you, and the representatives are these white points. And what you can see now is that there are too many points in the low density regions and too few points in the high density region. And that's somehow clear if you think about what the Kimmins algorithm does. And if you have points which are outliers far away, then the algorithm tries to put centers on these points because otherwise you get a huge distortion. And if you if you're in a very high density area, then somehow the algorithm doesn't need to put very many points there because only already one point is enough to cover quite a bit of sample points without accumulating lots of distortion. So you always have this phenomenon that the density tends to be underrepresented in high density areas and it's overrepresented in low density areas. Okay, and in fact, I think this is well known. Um, this has already been discovered a long time ago. And you can in fact even characterize the distribution. It's going to be a power of your original density. So if you start with a density, then these representatives are distributed according to some power of the density. And the exponent in the power now depends on exactly what distortion method you use and what dimension your space is. Okay. And the only exception is if your data is uniform in the first place, so if you have uniform data, then nothing goes wrong. Because somehow the data doesn't have any high or low density area, everything is, is flat, and then you don't sort of, uh, you don't run into these problems. <coughs> but now from a theoretical point of view, this is in fact pretty disappointing. It says, if you do this approach, you start with a density and throw away a couple of data points and just keep the representatives, we introduce some distortion, right? I mean, after we selected the representatives, we have a new dis we have a different distribution than the one we had before. And maybe in practice it doesn't make such a big difference because maybe the power of the density is still somewhat similar to your original density and you might sort of still get reasonable results. But you do have a bias and at least from a theoretical point of view, you, I mean this is sort of a no-go. I mean. And there's no way you could reverse this. I mean once you did that, um, sort of you do it. And now there is a very simple way, in fact, how you can construct an unbiased vector quantization procedure. And this now has to do with this um, LP distance we've seen, with the shortest path distance we've seen before. And the way it works is as follows. You're given your data set. You now build an unweighted nearest neighbor graph on your data set. And now you select the representatives, not according to the square Euclidean distance, but according to the shortest path distance in, this, in the unweighted k neighbor. And then the theorem says that if you do that, the representatives selected in this manner have exactly the same distribution as your original data. So all you do is, in this figure here, instead of measuring this distortion here, instead of in, in, with a square Euclidean distance, you use the shortest path distance here. Right, and um, before I dive into, into explaining why this is true, I just have a figure here. So on top you have the result, of, I mean it's exactly the same data set, one Gaussian. On top you have the result of standard k, of standard k means, and in the bottom you have the result of this new algorithm. And you can already see it, I mean by visual inspection, the standard k means has too many points in the outskirts and too few points in the inner part of the density. And this new algorithm seems to look okay. I mean it doesn't have too many points in the, in the, in the low density area, and in fact there are quite a lot of points in the inner part. I mean, it, I mean, it looks okay at least. I mean, of course, it is not a proof. And now to prove this, um, in fact, we, we explored one particular trick, which is about this uniformizing uh, statement. I already, I already mentioned before that the KNN graph tends to make data uniform. And here is now a bit more of a formal way of saying that 
If you don't get it, don't worry. The, the, it's only one or two slides, and then it's going to be more figures again. But um, we want to define what is what, what we call a uniformizing transformation, which is we're given a data space with a particular geometry, and now we have in, induce a, we introduce a mapping that maps this data space to a new geometry. And this mapping is going to be in such a way that the new geometry after the mapping has a uniform density. And the way this, this works is, um, like in manifolds, the geometry is essentially defined by the inner products in the tension spaces. So um, if we're in the tension space of X, we simply replace this inner product by a new inner product, the one down here, which has these factors P to the power 1 over D um, sort of squeezed in. This is all we do. Um, so in, in, in Geometry one also says it's a conformal transformation, it essentially just adds a factor. And, and this is exactly what we do if we, if we walk along this path, we, we have sort of have factors we integrate. And now what happens is as follows, I try to, to describe it in this side table here. So on the left side we have the original space, that's the one we started with, say it's just a subset of Rd, no manifold there, just a subset of Rd, Euclidean distance. And density P, that's what we start with. <coughs> Now what we did before is we, we now said, okay, now let's look at this LP geometry, the geometry induced by the shortest path distance. So, I mean, we can just say on, the, on this old space we, we take this new, um, geometry. And now the trick is we have this uniformizing transformation which now goes to some new space. And if we look at this new space, then the geodesic distances in the space correspond to what was the, the this DP distance in the original space. But the density is uniform now. So here we have essentially an equivalent, so these distances are the same. But here we have density P, and, on, and after this transformation, we have uniform density. Okay? And this is how this, um, this is the formal way of describing why the, uh, the KNN graph makes things uniform. And now the proof is, in fact, very, I mean, at least the concept is very simple. Um, we know that this DP distance, that's what we've just seen, induces a uniform distribution on the data. But uniform distributions are the only distributions where vector conversation doesn't do any harm. So if you have a uniform distribution, simply nothing, nothing bad happens. Um, so if we do this vector conversation with this metric, we are fine. So that you can go back and forth between these two views. And now this DP metric it can be approximated by the shortest path metric in this unrelated k right? and, and plugging all these things together and working on the beta shows in the end that if we do this vector conversation with this shortest path distance, then we get no distortion in our distribution. <coughs> okay. Um, maybe maybe one more comment about this. You can this can also be used to downsample an unrelated k nearest neighbor graph because essentially if you do this kind of vector conversation, you can construct a nice downsampling procedure and we still keep the density intact. And this is another part of you, uh, but we, I don't want to discuss details here. Okay, so this was an application, like the vector conversation was an application where we could see that it really can help to look to, to use this kind of shortest path distance and to know also to know what it is in fact. And now I want to dive into a different question which is related to density estimation. I've already said it, we've seen both figures before. Density estimation in an unweighted k n graph is hard. If we look at the weighted k nearest neighbor graph on the left hand side, the, the degrees just show us the density. On the right hand side, we have the, we have the unweighted graph, and the degrees don't show anything, at least not, not the density. Um, now, why is this really a very difficult question to estimate the density? I, I think I, I mean, I'm going to repeat a couple of things here, but I think this is really important to get the point. So, uh, we, we, we see this, this is again this um, KNN graph with these two red regions and just by looking at these two red regions we couldn't see whether the red region comes from a low density area or from a high density area. <coughs> because we just don't know the edge, edge length, we just know where are the edges. And the problem is now a density is something in sort of, it's, it's something very local. A density is just tells you in this local area I expect to have so and so many data points. So it's a very local quantity. But so this, this figure here shows that we can't just look at the local region in our space and say the density in this region is 50. We wouldn't be able to do that. Because the local region in the graph is not going to tell us this density. So the question is, um, is there a way, I mean local information definitely wouldn't do the job, but is there a way to induce global information into an estimate, such that in the end we get a density estimate? And this is really a very 
difficult question because all other density estimates I know about essentially are low physics. I mean, the kernel density estimate just looks in an open neighborhood. All these kinds of estimates do that. Okay, now there's one inside, there's just one, one tiny little thing that is related to the density in the cane n graph, and it's a very subtle thing. And to describe it, I want to look at directed cane years in the graph. So a directed, in a directed cane years in the graph, we keep the, direct, the, the directions of our edges which point from a data point to its k nearest neighbors. And if you do that, um, here I just have a toy figure, um, it tends to be the case that if you have a point in a low density region, its neighbors tend to sit in a higher density region, but not the other way around. And you can see this from the figure here. This point here has its, I mean, it's in a low density region, it's sort of an outlier. Its, it's closest neighbors are pretty far away, they sit here, so we have we have this error going from low density to high density, but we don't have it the other way around, because like the points in the high density region are not going to link to this other point far away in the low density region. So within the high density region, the, point, the links are going to stay there. And so this is the only kind of thing you can sort of imagine where you could exploit some effect of the density in an unweighted canyon's never It's just this is the only effect the density might have. And now I want to, this is now a bit technical. Um, I have two slides how to do this density estimate and then it consists in two steps. The first step is something local and then the second step is something global. So locally, so, so what we now want to try to do is we want to try to, to exploit this sort of information about the gradient of the density um, edges pointing into different directions depending on whether the density is high or low. Now the way we are going to do this is as follows. So assume there will be fixed data at x, so we want to estimate the density at x. We first define what I call out of x. It's just the out, the, the set of out links of x. So the point, essentially, the nearest. This is just the nearest neighbors of x, like all the points where the out links of x point. Right? This is something like a ball. You can see this in the figure here. Like all points will sit inside such a ball. Now, just um, for the sake of exercise, um, assume there is. We have just some hyperplane. Don't worry about where we get it from. But just assume we have a hyperplane. Um, that goes through x and has some tangent vector t. Now what we do is we look at what I call left and right. So left is just the number of points in this left half space of, of the ball and right is the number of points in the right half space of the ball. Right? So this is just the definition for now. And now the idea is if the density is increasing, if it goes, if it increases from left to right, then you would expect, as I also plotted it here in the figure, that there are more data points in the right half than in the left half, simply because the density in the right half is just a tiny bit larger than the one in the left half. Right? So the hope might be that if you compare the number of points in the left and right sides of, of this hyperplane, this gives you an estimate of the gradient of the density at this particular point. Right? It's also clear that this is something pretty subtle because I mean we have lots of variations here. Um, there's quite a number, I mean, we have some noise here, there's sometimes we have fewer and sometimes we have less data points here, and now we look at the difference of left, uh, of right minus left, essentially, so, and, and the difference of two noisy things can be something very unpleasant, so. in particular because this difference has a lower order of magnitude. So what we, the way we do this now formally is we, it's a, instead of looking at the gradient, we just look at the direction and derivative of the density. So p prime t is supposed to be the direction and derivative and direction of t. <coughs> and now we have a formal theorem that says, if you now look, really look at this difference right minus left, so how many more points do I have on the right side and on the left side, and we rescale it appropriately, then this converges to a function here on the right hand side, which is the direction and derivative, divided by some function of the density, like a power of the density. Okay? And this is essentially, I mean, this is a bit tricky to prove it. I don't want to go into details, but this is what you can get. So just by comparing a local neighborhood, you get not an estimate of the gradient itself, but an estimate of the gradient divided by some density. So this sounds first of all nice, but now what are we going to do? We want to estimate the density and not this funny kind of function. And now if you keep on thinking, or maybe in hindsight it's easier to say that uh, if you have a gradient, so what do you do to get the function back? You need to integrate in some way. And integration, in fact, is something that is also something global. And the question is now how, do we, how are we going to do that? And the trick is now the following. We now fix one point, which I call the anchor point. In fact, I don't know whether this is a good image word, but it's just one point I want to keep fixed. And I also have x, which is the point where I want to estimate my density. 
And now what I do is I look at the path between this anchor point and the point I want to estimate my density. And I look at the path gamma n in the, sh in the shortest path in the graph. So here we again with the shortest path. And I also look at gamma, which is the corresponding path in the underlying space. And now here is the trick. I mean, it's all hidden. In. So what I now want to do is I want to integrate along this path. Integrating along the path essentially means I sum up for all points which are on the path. I sum up a certain quantity. And the thing I sum up is just here this function I, I know how to estimate. So here for all z in the path gamma n, we sum this quantity here. And now that's uh, the first miracle we know. I mean, this is exa exactly the same as this conversion of the shortest path. We know that we can approximate, well, this is going to converge to a quantity which is a path integral along gamma, the continuous path. And we are going to get this factor p to the power 1 over d here, if we go to the continuous path. This is just, I mean, by analogy to the shortest path distance. You can prove that it's, it's, it's the same. I mean, oh, I, I guess I forgot a scaling constant here, but don't worry. So we have this formula in the middle here. And now that's where the bigger miracle occurs. Uh, the, these, there are lots of terms, like the, the important terms cancel. So this p to the 1 over d here cancels with, the, with this 1 over d in the exponent here. Sorry. And we're left with uh, what is here on the right hand side. And now maybe people start to think, okay, p integral p prime over p, we know that, that's not. I mean, this is really, this is a primitive. Um, and okay, it's a bit more complicated here because we integrate a number pass and we need to show that it's some, um, I mean, it's a gradient field and the integral really only depends on starting endpoint, but all this goes through. And in the end, what you get then, I mean, just as you would intuitively hope, that this whole thing is log p of x minus log p of a0. And x is the point we want to estimate the density, and a0 was the anchor point. Okay, so this is, the, this is, I mean, the main reasoning how all this works. And what this gives you then is the following theorem. Mm. We now, uh, so to estimate the density at x, we, we look at the shortest path starting from this anchor point. Along the shortest path, we always estimate these differences between right and left. And we need to rescale, and then it's going to converge to log p of x minus some constant. And this is really a constant because this is the same fixed constant for all points we want to look at, so we keep this anchor point once forever. So this is just a constant. Now we take the exponent and then we get an estimate of the density up to this multiplicative constant, um, which is the p of a0, which you can't sort of can't resolve anyway. Right. So I think this is really cool. I mean it took us one and a half years to get this to solve this stupid question. <laughs> Um, and I'm really proud that we solved it. So, I mean, this is the first kind of density estimation result we have so far. Um, and I have a couple of more comments, but let's maybe first show that it really works. I mean, theory is sometimes, sometimes nice, but sometimes theory is theory and it's practice. So, here we have at least a bit of practice. It's a toy simulation. Uh, on the left hand side, I have two distributions. I always show the correct, like the, the true density, log density values, and on the right hand side, I show the estimated log density values. And in the top row here, we have a, just a Gaussian distribution. This black star here is the anchor point, just one random data point. And you see here on the right hand side, we get the estimated density, and I mean, up to half the factor, this is really, I mean, it does capture the correct thing. And the same here in the bottom, bottom two figures, where it's much more astonishing. Even so, here I have on the left hand side this piecewise Gaussian density, so it's piecewise, to the, like uh, uniform density here, uniform low density, and here uniform high density. And on the right hand side, you see it gets estimated correctly. And I mean, this really is, I mean, I didn't even believe that this uh, would work uh, in my best dreams because, I mean, here, if you look at this graph, okay, so there's no gradient involved with any of these pieces. Just if you just go along this boundary between the two classes, then you might see a bit of like some arrows pointing more from the left side to the right side than, than, than in the other one. But this is really very subtle, I and mean, it just happens in this very, very narrow strip of the density. And I'm really sort of surprised that it does work. So, um, those of you who are still awake and still can think and are with me um, might have noticed that I cheated a bit. Because here, when I uh, made this definition, of course, this kind of hyperplane construction you cannot do if you just have the JCC of the graph. You don't know where this hyperplane is and you don't know what is left and right. So uh, this is, in, in this sense, it's cheating. And now this is very apparently we have a conjecture. 
uh, to the results is kind of cheating. And the conjecture works as follows. So now assume we, we again have our shortest path and we want to integrate what we call left and right. And now instead of defining left and right with a hyperplane, we do the following trick. We say this is again our outset <laughs> of the point we're interested in. And now we go one point to the left on the path. So XL is uh, the, just the predecessor of this point on the path. And we look at the outset at this point and we intersect these two. This gives the purple set here. And then we go one point to the right on the path. Oh, this stupid laptop. Um, it's not mine, sorry. <laughs> um, and do the same on the right hand side, and this is what we define as left and right. And then again, we look at the difference between these two things. And our conjecture is that this is also going to give us a density estimate. And in fact, the simulation we've done here are made with this construction from the conjecture. So, I did, so in this simulation, we didn't use any hyperplanes and so on. So this simulation is really just um, about the adjacency matrix and nothing else. Um, and so we haven't really, I mean, we are on the way of proving that conjecture, but it's really very technical, and we have some steps we have already proved, some we are still struggling, so I'm sure it's true, but it's just a matter of time to find the proof. Okay. So is this now good or bad? Um, on the one side, it's of course great. I mean, we managed to solve this problem of estimating the density from an unweighted KN graph. It's a very complicated thing to do. It doesn't look easy, so um, we're happy to solve it. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, before asking for questions, uh, I have to admit what I'm really fascinated about here is that you try to get geometry and graph and uh, back to each other. So from my perspective, it means maybe relational learning will take over the world. <laughs> uh, maybe that's also a good way to start questions. Other questions? A brief, stupid question. It was an excellent talk, but I got lost when you said that the special path measure induces a uniformity on the distribution. You explained that, and I think I understood, but then I forgot. Could you just repeat why this is the case? So, essentially, I mean, very intuitive, you could just look at, at such a figure. Oh, where do I have it? And the fact that we can't see anything from these from these two red things, essentially, I mean, intuitively it already says that the graph doesn't have, I mean, it looks uniform wherever you are. And the intuition is, if you have, if you have a density, assume it's, 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 it's smooth. Then if you look at a very local scale, the density is sort of constant in this local environment, right? And for a constant density, the KN graph looks the same no matter whether the density is constant at a level of 0 0.1 or constant at a, at a level of 0 0.10, uh, sorry, 0, uh, 0 0.5. So, so, so locally, uh, like a canyon's neighbor graph in a local environment always looks like it comes from a uniform distribution, but it just couldn't say what is the level of the density. Like. And this is essentially the intuitive reason, and the formal reason is that the proof works, but <laughs> I think this is really the intuition behind it. Right. So, so you, uh, you talked about the uh, with K and K and N in the, in the case of, uh, in the last case, with the, uh, I, I was wondering, is there a similar dependence on K in, in the vector uh, quantization? So in the vector quantization literature, I mean, all these results are K goes to infinity, so I think their K is pretty much free. So it's not, so you can, so uh, if I remember correctly, in this vector quantization case, you can first drive into infinity and then K independently to infinity, so it doesn't really matter well, how you choose K for the sector computation, like in the standard vector computation. So that's more or less works for any kind of K. Uh, thank you, Michael. The, uh, my thing is, when you are in the first part, when you are doing this vector computation, right? Uh, if I understand correctly, in order that you are, say, changing the inner product by, um, say, taking into account the local density, so it means that you need the second part of the talk yes. to build the first part. Yeah, right? well, anyway, so that's, that's no, in uh, fact, no. We need this for the proof. For the proof, I mean, if you want to prove it, that's the way we do the, we do the formal proof. But in practice, we just need the shortest path distances. Because, we, I mean, the, this change of geometry just shows why it's true. But what we do in practice is we just look at the shortest path distances in the unweighted Kenyan's neighbor graph. And this is what we use for our distortion. And then the rest happens by itself. I mean, we just, 
I mean, the only difference is instead of looking at square Euclidean distances in S and K-mean, for distortion you look at the shortest path distance as a deviation pattern. And that is all. So you, you don't have to do this, this change of geometry. I mean, this change of geometry happens implicitly just by the fact that I use this other kind of distance function instead of the Euclidean square distance function. Yes, but, but you have the P of X, which is something which only depends on, on the, the say, the U, okay, you have this U V, the, the scalar product, mm -hmm. okay, and you have the local that's U and the local that's U. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, for, that, that's just for the proof. I mean, in the proof, okay. I need to show that the shortest, if I do this thing, it, it, so essentially the proof says, if I look at these shortest path distances, then this is what's going to happen. It is as if I do such a transformer, such, such a uniformizing transformation, and this is the reason why in the end density doesn't play a role. Like, okay, it, it doesn't matter. So this is just for the form of proof. One more uh, question. I was uh, I was wondering whether okay. So now there is this quantity, which was for the proof, but now we are in let's say for the practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether you could construct an estimate of this local p by saying if I'm doing a divide and conquer approach, what I want to find is some languages when I I would say extract the representative on the representative should give something which is similar. You mean I do it repeatedly? Right. I would be surprised if that worked if you look at the Euclidean distance, because like in each step, in fact, you introduce a distortion which works. So if you do it once, you get, instead of the distribution, you get the power, like the distribution up to some, like up to some power. And then if you do it again, you take again the same power. So somehow it, it just gets worse. But I'm not sure I, I got like that too. But maybe we can discuss it all that. Um. <laughs> well, here was still one question. Uh, so in your motivating example, in your motivating example, there was a similarity between proteins. Yes, uh, we know that the, the graph there is a tree. So does that? Sorry, thing. I didn't get the beginning. So in the you had a motivating example of a similarity between proteins and blasters. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we know there that the, the graph is a tree. Does your theory still apply in any way? Or you mean if the graph is a tree, does it? Well, it is a tree, almost certainly normal for the proteins. You know, the process of evolution is. is okay, you say the similarity is related to some tree structure that is inherent in my data. I see your question, but I don't know any answer, I think. So, uh, so my guess is, I mean, somehow this, this says something about the similarity structure. I mean, you say, if I know more, essentially, I think on an abstract level, the question is, if I know more about the similarity function than just the values, but I know that the similarity function has a certain structure, like a tree, can I then sort of exploit this in, in my estimate? Three, three is the um, in fact, I wouldn't know how to do it, but maybe there would be a way. I mean, the similarities. So, I mean, I, in, in this work, I always took the similarity function as something abstract. And in the KN graph, definitely it's, the tree information got lost, but maybe there is something else you could do that sort of. I don't know. So, maybe instead of just, I mean, KNN is a very good way of, of approximating uh, the similarity function, it just says the edge is there or it's not there, so it's similar or not similar. So maybe if you have such a tree structure, you could do something like you have different levels of similarity which sort of go along your tree. And maybe then you can do more about it. I mean, this is just what I'm guessing. The answer is I don't really know. Okay, um, before giving over to Philip, because before the reception he wants to make a comment, I still have a comment or I'm wondering. So recently, Jerry Zhu and other people um, we're working heavily on or making use of what is called resistant homology. Um, and I somehow feel this is very much related. So instead of looking at directions, we may have a look at epsilon graphs for different epsilons. Mm -hmm. And then by moving the epsilon, we may also get density information and differential information mm -hmm. over it. But maybe we can uh, take that offline. I just wanted to make the comment because it's interesting that's in the AI community. So you really see, or I would expect, really, we will see much more of these results uh, in the future, and it's just exciting to me. But maybe even more exciting is the reception and a comment, hopefully, by Philip. 
So before that, let's maybe thank the 